you know, you never know when you're just going to have an off weekend. I've kind of gotten the ability to have the platform that uh, I want, and, and it is my platform, and I can speak to whatever I feel like talking about. We're in the mix, and it makes it a lot more fun when you're in the mix than you are just, you know, struggling and, and trying to figure out what direction it goes. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough, and sorry for being bouncy the roads here. <laughs> it's not really tough that you have, you know, the all you can eat buffet every single day of the week. People are going to get tired of it, right? So if it's a special thing, I think people get more excited for it. Bye. Hi, Bo. Raise your hand up so she can see it. There you go. There you go. So even as a kid, I think it was, right. you know, Thanks, buddy. very head scratching. Why at the beginning we all four of us just went instantly straight to the back. We just really struggled. Well, welcome on to the backstretch. I am News 5's Heather Williams and Bristol. A little bit of a disappointment. Everybody had like these ideas that it would be this wonderful tire wear race, uh, like the spring, but not as bad, exhilarating racing that people on different strategies. And don't get me wrong, I am not of the camp that Bristol was a bad race. I, I thought Bristol was a fine Bristol was a fine race. Wasn't a great race. Expectations are really high at Bristol, but it wasn't a bad race. It certainly wasn't what we expected. I talked to doing the radio broadcast um, for PRN and qualifying. I talked to a lot of drivers that were really surprised at how the track ended up racing, how it was during practice, how it was during qualifying, because it wasn't all what they expected. It wasn't all what they set their cars up for. They came into Bristol assuming there would be some tire wear. Maybe not the 30 laps that we got the last time and the, and the tires recording, but this was the same tire and they tested it over the summer and it was also having some tire wear over the summer. And then we get to Bristol last week and there's nothing like they could have run. Chase Briscoe told me they could have run 200 laps on those tires, which is insane and not, not at all what NASCAR or Goodyear or anybody wanted out of that Bristol race. They kind of like how it went in the spring. They kind of wanted that. Maybe not 30 laps, maybe 50 laps. Well, you can't run a whole fuel uh, run on a set of tires. But they didn't get it. So then it was just who's the fastest and who can can uh, put a whooping on the field. And we all know who the answer to that is more often than not, and it's Kyle Larson. And kudos to Kyle because he went out there and did what he needed to do, ran full out, put a hurting on the field. It is what it is. But he passed a lot of cars. He lapped a lot of cars. So that's passing. Bubba Wallace, Ryan Blaney, Austin Sendrick picked up double-digit places from where they qualified to where they finished. That's passing cars. They passed a lot of cars. So to say that this race was boring and there was no passing is a little bit disingenuous because it's not true. There was plenty of passing in this race. Now, passes for the lead? Absolutely not. Kyle Larson just all day but there were certainly passing so I'll, I'll talk more about that kind of in my final thoughts but on the show today we will of course have Chris Carey I'll get his thoughts on the race I'll get his thoughts on who he thinks needs to step up their game and who has a chance to advance to the next round of the playoffs and my guest this week is Christopher Bell can't wait to talk to Christopher um <clears throat> one of my favorite drivers in the garage area to talk to. I really like talking to everyone. I say, I feel like I say this every week because I really do like talking to just about everybody in the garage area. Uh, but Christopher's great. And being a playoff driver, he'll have some really good insight into what we can expect this next round. What I love about Christopher is he is such just like a below the radar kind of guy, right? Nobody's talking about Christopher Bell right now. I think he's second in the points. He's made it to the last two championship fours. Why are we not talking about Christopher Bell? But he likes it that way, so it's cool. We are going to talk about Christopher Bell and kind of get his thoughts as we head into Kansas. So let's get going. Joining us now is our crew chief, Chris Carey, who is also the crew chief of the number 75 Food Country Truck in the Craftsman Truck Series. Kyle Larson put on a hurting mm. to the rest of the field at Bristol. So does that make this a bad race, or is Larson just that good? 
Well, I did, uh, a couple of guys in our in my shop, we were talking about this today. Uh, the, the fellow that's a big Kyle Larson fan, and you know, he mentioned he said something about the um, some of the fans were saying it was a terrible race, and you know, Heather, it, it's really not anybody's fault that Kyle Larson is as good as he is, and he and his team, his crew chief, everybody came up with a fantastic plan. They, they hit the nail on the head on every decision they made, obviously, and, you know, he was just better from the word go. He never, I don't really think he was ever really contested, really. Uh, they just, and, and they, they played the race out flawlessly. He made no mistakes. They made no mistake. They did nothing to shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, if they ever did make any changes to the car they, they, during the race, they were right on. They kept ahead of the racetrack. And sometimes it goes, just goes that way. And I, I don't know if it's, uh, I, can't, I can't say that, oh gosh, that's NASCAR's fault or that's the racetrack's fault or that's the lack of sealer's fault or whatever it is, the tire's fault. The guy's just pretty doggone good. And they're good. The team he's got is good because it still takes, even with Kyle Larson, it still takes really good race cars to perform that well, and they're doing their job. So, um, th th is the short track program with these cars still as good as it can be? Pr probably not. There's still some changes to make. Um, I don't know if we need to base that on Bristol, but he just, man, and, and you know, the, the uncharacteristic of him. He, he ran most of the race down on the bottom. Mm -hmm. I was just hooking that bottom where that little bit of sealer was and rubber buildup was that uh, I think was just very narrow and his car was good enough and he was good enough to, to hit it pretty much every time, 400 and some laps out of 500. That's just, whoo, that's just, that's just stomping a mud hole in the whole field, so. Anyway. The thing that amuses me about NASCAR fans is they always talk, well, there's a, the list is long, but um, is long. they always talk about wanting the old Bristol back. Mm -hmm. And we pretty much got that this week. Mm -hmm. And when you tell them that, you know, you realize with the old Bristol, you have uh, Kale Yarbrough leading 100 or 495 laps and winning by seven laps. Yep. And then people say, but there's passing all through the field. This weekend, there was passing all through the field. Yeah, yeah. Bubba Wallace passed yeah. a lot of cars. Yes. Ryan Blaney passed a lot of cars. Yes. Austin Cedric passed a lot of cars. And fans still aren't happy. Well, the, I guess, first of all, it, it, was, it was great weather. Kudos to Dave Dirks for, <laughs> for working that out for us. You know, he's got a direct connection somehow. But, um, uh, and I should say his staff, his team, but, but uh, you know, it was great weather. I mean, I don't know what, if there's an official count of how many people, but there was a good crowd there. It was over 100,000. It, it was a good crowd. It was very, to me, uh, it, it, was, it was very, uh, very optimistic to me for the future. The people were there, and I even noticed it when I was down early in the week toward that, toward that way, I pulled over into the racetrack grounds, looked around, and I think this was on Monday, I believe. And man, it was it was a lot more campers than I was used to seeing the last few years already. I said, okay, this is a good sign. There were more campers in the campgrounds around the racetrack on Thursday. We were there for the truck race than I had seen in a long time. So people were optimistic about it. Again, that there was it was grooves everywhere. The whole racetrack was that you were able to race on the whole racetrack. To me, as a racer, that's what you want. As a promoter, that's what I would want. I would right. want to be ever, you know, because you got um, 40 cars on the racetrack. It's a half mile. It's a fast place. You want want people to have somewhere to go. And we're right back to the, the way we started at the program. It's I don't think it's anybody's fault that Kyle Larson just went in there and did. A, a, a terrific job, first of all, in the seat of driving that place for 500 laps. I, lo I loved J Jeff Burton's analysis during the race. I believe it was Burton, it, or it could have been uh, one of the others, but he talked about Larson passing, getting through traffic, not, not for position, but just getting through lap traffic and making his way up to the field during one of the long runs midway through the race. And, and he said, you know, the thing is, he said, this as a driver, it's very frustrating. You have to be very patient and very disciplined because you're passing a car like three or four inches a turn. You know, and if you think about that, that is like 
oh my gosh, I think I'd jump off a bridge or yeah. something if I had to do that. And Larson was just like, he was so disciplined. He never put himself in peril. He never put his car in peril. He never, he never took big risk. He drove within his limits, which he's got pretty big limits. And, you know, I just, the greatest races at Bristol were, 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 were somebody, it, it was mind over matter. It was like patience and being able to do, you know, to be able to conquer that thing 500 laps on that racetrack. That's part of it. It's kind of sort of like the Southern 500. It's, it's part of, of mastering the, the uh, you know, the challenge of that racetrack and so many laps on that racetrack that beats you to death inside the car. It beats you to death if you're standing in the pits. And, and for Larson to do that great a job, it was, it was very iconic. And to me, it's, a, it's like for you going here forward to here goes the competition again. We're, we're back in the playoffs. We're looking at what's next. And Kyle Larson has just <laughs> knocked us all out, yeah. you know, with like 10 punches in a row. And we're like, oh my gosh, I don't know if we're ever going to beat him or not. So uh, don't, don't, don't throw stones at Bristol Speedway or whatever. They, they, do, they do a tremendous job putting on races down there. And they've done all they can do to try to figure out you know, how to have the best races. And if you love going to watch, like you said, if you love going to watch cars pass other cars, that's the place to be. That's yeah. the best racing. So the round of 12 is now set after yes, Bristol. When you look at the guys that are currently below the cut line, start around two. Austin Sendrick, Daniel Suarez, Alex Bowman, and Chase Briscoe. Who has the best chance of moving on to round three? Well, out of that group, I would say it's Alex Bowman, I think. Now, he's had a very up-down year. He's been... Uh, you know, coming back from injury and all this stuff that, that kept him out some last year and, and all this stuff that, that's kind of beat him down. He's been competitive, not competitive, competitive, not competitive. He's had bright spots and dark spots. He's been in the rumor mill, like, okay, he's going to lose his job and this, that, and other and all this stuff. Um, a very strong run at Bristol. A very strong run at Bristol. Yeah. When the pole was there, the only thing that, that hurt him was he had a teammate named Kyle Larson. <laughs> but, but you know, his, his, he is capable. That team's capable, and Bowman is capable. They've just got to push reset right now and go forward like they did at Bristol and go forward and play one race at a time and maximize their capability. And I think he, he could be one that could go on into the next round if you don't watch him. Now, I think, you know, the other guys, that, you know, Suarez is kind of hanging on. Chase Briscoe's done a tremendous job. He had a flurry come through at Darlington and got in the playoffs and so on. But I, I, I don't want people to, to sleep on Austin Sindrick. No, And I'll tell I you don't. why. This next round sets up perfectly for him. Oh, if he can survive Kansas, absolutely. which absolutely. is probably his weakest of the, of the one. Absolutely. Super Speedway in Talladega, yep. road course in yeah. Charlotte. That's got Austin Sendrick written all over it. So he, he could he could be a sleeper. And I, and I don't want to call either one of the other guys sleepers. I, I, think, I think Daniel Suarez is kind of, he's just kind of been hanging on a little bit and, and so on and so forth. Um, He's a good road racer, too. Well, and Anybody can win a Talladega. He, he, he got so. through this last round because he he did well in the super speedway yes. and the road course. Yes, sir. Bristol was yes, a disaster, but he had I, enough points in the first two yeah. races. It didn't matter. It's kind of the opposite. If he can yeah. get through Kansas, yeah. he might have a chance. This this next round could be just, I think, simply because you hit you 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 hit on it. It's like the, the, what the races are, except for maybe Kansas this week. If you go to Talladega, you go to the Roval, those are wild card races and different people can win. And the ones up at the, in the middle and the top that are, we would consider the favorites to be, go on into the next round. Guys like Joey Logano, guys like Denny Hamlin, some of those guys, guys like Ryan Blaney. I'll um, tell you who I think should be the most nervous of those guys that are in right now is William Byron. I think that so team too. has not been running well at no, all the last no, few he, weeks. And this next round doesn't, I mean, he's okay. He has a Daytona win. He's an mm -hmm. okay super speedway. Mm -hmm. But really before that Daytona win, he hadn't done much on the on the super speedways. He's not that great of a road course racer. He's nope. okay. He, right. he, if he gets a win at Kansas, he's in good shape, which I think that's their best chance. I, I think so too. I think the, the, the Hendrick and the, well, the Hendrick and the Gibbs cars would be the ones that I would probably say would, would, would have probably the best chance of having the best company day at Kansas, I believe. But but again, like we, we talk about Talladega, it's it's such a wild card. I mean, we could 
take all 12 of them out on lap 10. <laughs> you know, it, and it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be anything we haven't seen before. They tried so to do that at Atlanta. <laughs> they, they did. So I think it's just, man, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think, I don't think there'd be many, maybe a couple of those guys that I would say, I would say Larson, Reddick would be the two guys that would be my favorite. And, and I would say, if I was a betting man and had to bet on a couple people, that'd probably be the, the two that I think would be the safest, the most likely to move on. But, but other than that, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think, of course, we'll know a lot more after this weekend at Kansas. Right. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, there again, <laughs> Talladega, man, anything happened there. And then you go to a, the Roval, which is a very hard road course. It's and they not changed easy. the configuration. They changed the configuration. There's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities at that road road course to make a mistake for any and everybody. And um, I don't know. It, I think it's going to be pretty interesting, pretty exciting. I think it'll come down after the Roval. Everybody will be rubbing their forehead, and some of them will be saying, "Boy, I'm glad that's over." <laughs> you know. And and we'll see. We'll see what happens. Stay tuned. So moving off the playoffs a little bit, yeah. there was a driver trade this weekend. You don't see that very often. Corey LaJoy <laughs> moves to Rick Ware Racing and Justin Haley to Spire starting this week in the middle of the season. I mean, I think I can think of one other time that that's happened in the history of NASCAR, um, which was Jeff Green and I think John Andretti in the middle of like the 2004, I, I, three season, something like that, switch your, cars. Your memory's a lot better than mine, <laughs> but I, I do remember that's part of that. And, I, and, and yes. Uh, so what do you think? Think about all this. Is this well, something we're going to see more of, or is it just happen to be right drivers, right time kind of thing? It's possible. I I kind of saw it coming a little bit, or I thought, but it did. It did sort of sort of surprise me in a way because again, like you're talking about, we're what uh, eight or nine races left, or whatever it is in the season, and switching. It, and the two actually are actually switching rides. They're the same same. You know, going from Rick Ware to Spire, and Spire to Rick Ware. Um, I, I personally, I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of Justin Haley. The kid can I, drive. I, I mean, the kid's a little, what I call, he's just a little gas master. He always has been. I think he's got that attitude. Um, I wouldn't call him an arrogant young man. I don't know him that well, but he's, you know, he's a guy that comes in and says, you know what, somebody's going to win this race, and it might as well be me. And he has done many times this year, he has competed at a high level with Rick Ware racing. I'm not cutting that team down, but but you know, just a, a, a little bit of a little bit of a team that's on the back burner as far as technology and resources compared with the competition. And he's done really well there this year. And I'm I know there was rumor mill, he was probably in in that little circle of my, who might end up in the 48 next year, and then this happened, that, and that kind of got squashed. Uh, Spire Motorsports having a strong relationship with Hendrick Racing, and that relationship is growing. Uh, they're also going to get a really good crew chief in those doors next year. Yeah, so, he's, he's going to be working with uh, maybe the best off-season crew chief that was uh, out there in Rodney he, Childers. Yes, yes, ma'am. He he might have got he might have got the Vince Lombardi of the crew chiefs <laughs> coming in there. So, you know, I, I look for. I personally look for a lot coming from that. I think they'll. I think that whole relationship, that tree will bear fruit. Now, don't throw coil of joy out to the wolves. You know, he's going to a team that's growing also and wants to get better. And they're not. They're not paupers. You know, these guys. They spend a lot of money. So. Uh, it'll uh, be not just in racing in uh, motorsports in general they got an yeah. NHRA team they do IndyCar like they're they're everywhere yeah they're they're everywhere and um, that you know they're they're not just going to lay over and say oh we lost our driver you know Corley Joy one thing about it Corley Joy is going to be motivated mm -hmm. he's going to be very he's motivated got a, he's got a six seven seven race audition for that ride he does and he's had some races here recently where he ran very well that whole company did well and, and Corey ran very well too. He's motivated. He wants to win that ride for next year. Um, don't be surprised if, you know, sometimes these things happen and at the end of the day, after all the dust settles, they run a little while and everybody kind of calms down and everybody gets used to it. All of a sudden you can stand back and look and say, you know what? Everybody's a winner here because everybody's doing better than they were, and there's no real common sense answer to two and two doesn't exactly equal four. But, you know, everybody's doing better. Everybody's happy. Everybody's over it. Move on. Go on. Think about something else, and good luck to all of them. And, and it's, just, it's just the way sometimes when human people 
mix and mingle, sometimes, the, you know, this guy does better with this guy, this lady does better with this group, this group does better with this. And it's just the way it is. It's that we're all human beings. We're not robots. And, and we have strengths and weaknesses that mix, mix or mingle with other human beings, especially in a very competitive environment and a very high pressure cooker environment. And, you know, these two drivers may be, they may be going to where they fit in. Yeah. And, and having the people around them, they may both go forward. You may, we may be having this conversation next year and saying, well, which one of Cody uh, or uh, uh, of uh, Corey Joy or Justin Haley is going to move on in the playoffs? Right. It could be that. So uh, best of luck to both of them is all I can say. And both those teams are growing teams. They're trying, they're all trying to get better. They're working hard. You know, who knows? We'll see what happens. All right, so speaking of what happens next, NASCAR heads to Kansas. This has become maybe the best race on the schedule. Closest finish in NASCAR history. We were there in mm -hmm. the spring. What are your thoughts about Kansas? Kansas is a, is a mile and a half track that most people call a cookie cutter racetrack. It's got a tri-oval on the front stretch. It's got, uh, you know, probably around 20 degree banking. I'm not sure which, you know. It's built for speed. But it's it's deteriorated the asphalt, not the not the facility, but the asphalt's kind of deteriorated over time. It's in a place where it's hot, as you well know, it's hot and cold a lot at extremes, which is hard on that surface. And the the speeds are fast as long as you have new, fresh Goodyear tires on there. And then after a few laps, the grip goes away and they start sliding around, and you're going to see a bunch of cars way up there against the wall, uh, mostly probably three and four in first, but probably all the way around the racetrack because that's where the most grip will be. Uh, some will be down on the bottom, be kind of like Bristol, except a little faster. And I think that people, all these teams are going to be working on their cars throughout the race, trying to keep ahead of the racetrack, trying to adjust their cars to fit their driver so he can just use the gas a little bit more every lap. And it don't, don't be surprised if there's another photo finish close and I, 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 as far as who's the favorite, I'm not sure. Uh, the favorite's going to be the, the guy that runs the laps the fastest, <laughs> <laughs> finishes first. But it, it wouldn't surprise me if you see our, our playoff guys at the, at the head of the pack. This is the race where this the playoff the guys are going to be at the front. I, I, I think so. I think Kyle Larson and the Hendrick team, I think uh, Denny Hamlin, Christopher Bell, the, the, the Gibbs people, uh, Joey Logano, who, who I still think is a... He's, he's kind of like a snake laying there in a, in, a, in a pile of rocks. He's just ready to strike. I mean, the guys, when the, the old saying when at time, kind of like Reggie Jackson, Mr. October back, back in the day. Um, he's, he seems like he and that team seem like they're the best when, when, it's, when the money's there and the pressure's on and it's time to go. They respond very well. So, and he's run there well there before. That team has a good, so, you know, just, man, this could be, this could be, again, again, the best race and the closest finish of the year. So, man, just uh, have a seat, watch, get you something to drink and, and enjoy because it's probably going to be an enjoyable race. Stay tuned again. <laughs> That's my hometown, so there's no place like home. Um, Kansas, I know for the Toyotas have traditionally been pretty good. What's your feeling going into Kansas uh, this weekend? Yeah, certainly it's a place that we are excited about coming to and hope that we can score a lot of points. You know, it's it's no secret that Toyotas have done really well here, specifically 2311. They've, uh, you know, won a lot of races at this racetrack. So um, with that being said, it's it's all about points right now. Starting the round at 12, we go to Talladega after this. So it is uh, mission critical to get out of here with points. Is it because this round is much like the first round, a lot of wild cards, is it? really important to do well at Kansas is that how you're approaching this this round to try to get as many points as you can this weekend yeah I mean I'm sure that everybody's agenda is a little bit different um myself and my team we know that Kansas and Charlotte Road Course are going to be good tracks for us so we need to maximize on those good tracks Talladega uh is a little bit of an unknown uh, I'm sure some guys have it circled but that's not a not one of the places that we have circled so this round of 12, obviously you've been here before, done that. Having the experience of kind of knowing how to maneuver it, new, maneuver it and knowing that you have the ability to perform at the Roval if you need to, does that give you confidence in this round? Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, I, I don't feel as confident about this one as I do the round of eight, 
Um, but I do know that Kansas and Charlotte are both great racetracks for us, and we should have a great opportunity to, uh, you know, advance to the round of eight. It's it it is makes it a lot easier whenever you can get out of Kansas with a good run and, and get some points in the bank, though. When you look at these playoffs, and, and just the the differences in the track this year compared tracks compared to previous years, do you like it better? Is it crazier? Is it worse? Like it just seems like the tracks this year have made have really mixed up the field and had some guys in there that maybe people didn't expect to even be in the round of twelve. Yeah, certainly the the racetracks and the, the way that the schedule works out has lended itself to um, a little bit of an unorthodox, you know, way to transfer. The super speedways are always just so, so tough because there's typically crashes. At Atlanta, we didn't really have a bunch of crashes, but it just brings the field so tight together that you can have guys that normally aren't finishing up front finish up front. And then the road courses, with the way that the yellow flags are at the stages, it, it really mixes up the running order all the time. So um, certainly these first two rounds have been very weird and uh, I'm, I'm, I've enjoyed it a little bit, but I'm definitely excited of, of hopefully transferring to the round of eight and get to some normal racetracks. Some people call Kansas the best racetrack on the schedule right now because of the way the next gen runs there. You agree? I was going to ask you, do you agree? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it's just so wide. And, and I think that's been the recipe for success with this next gen car is going to the intermediate racetracks with lots of lanes, lots of grooves to run. The restarts here are always incredible. We saw that amazing finish here in the spring. And I think that we're, we're poised for another great finish in the fall. For my final thought, I want to talk about the expectations of NASCAR fans. Now, I feel like I've kind of talked about this before and we've had this discussion before, but Sometimes I really feel like NASCAR fans' expectations are a little bit unreasonable. I mean, sometimes in the NFL, you get a 42 to nothing game. There's not no, it's not a thing you can do about it, or a 3 to nothing game. It's just what happens. Sometimes in baseball, it's a 1 nothing pitcher's duel. Sometimes in baseball, it's a 14 to nothing blowout. Bristol was a 14 to nothing blowout, right? I mean, nobody was really, really had a chance to win that race other than Kyle Larson. And that's okay. He's the ace. He had his A game. He took care of business. But there were still interesting things within the race. Like, it was not a terrible race. I was there. I was standing in the pits for the entire race. Lots of passing. Lots of storylines with the... With Four guys trying to get in to the playoffs and the guys trying not to fall out of the playoffs and that yo-yoing constantly during the race. I feel like there was real drama. Now, I wasn't, because I was working on the Twitter, Twitter sphere, or X sphere, or whatever you call that now, um, breathing in that oxygen that sometimes infuses into the race fans opinions during the race so I had no idea what anyone else was thinking during the race I was working and watching and observing and doing my own thing the the TVs in the media center were flipping back and forth between NBC and um and the radio broadcast and the PA system so I got a little bit of flavor of that I was listening to the scanner so I was getting what the drivers think but was it the best Bristol race absolutely not not even close was it the worst Absolutely not. Not even close. I don't care what anyone says about the good old days of Bristol. But Cale Yarborough winning by seven laps and leading 495 of the 500 laps. Come on now. It's what you saw on Saturday. Plus, no one was on the lead lap. No one was a lap down. No one was two laps down. No one was three laps down, four laps down, five laps down, six laps down. The only one was Kale. I'm sorry. That's not the good old days to me. I don't want to see three cars on the lead lap. That is not my cup of tea. So if that's what you want, I mean, you, you darn near got it this week. So I don't know. I don't know why NASCAR fans always feel like they're never satisfied. They could eat cake every day and they would complain it was too sweet. They could eat steak every day and they would complain that it's undercooked. It's fine. Everybody has their opinion. I, for one, am of the opinion 
Brissell was fine. It wasn't great. It wasn't exciting. It was fine. Sometimes 14 to nothing baseball games happen. Thanks for joining us on the Backstretch. We'll see you next week.